Okay, so we've got Dr. Ian Brooks with us today. I've pronounced that correctly, haven't I? <laughs> yes, uh, you've got that right, Matt. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so, so yeah, thanks so much for, for jumping on today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We just had a, a brief conversation before we started. And um, yeah, you've got a quite a background. So qualified personal trainer back in the day, uh, moving into yeah. being a, a clinical psychologist. Uh, all, and, then, and then after that, you moved into organizational psychology. Was that right? Yeah, that's that's it. That's it. Got got all got all of them, and and also a a, a certified bartender as well. So <laughs> I, ca I captured all the things that uh, match people's mind, body, and soul. Um, yeah. <laughs> <in some way. laughs> I think it's always good when you speak to someone that has quite a a, a well-rounded background and lots of different experiences, and I think particularly obviously you're a coach now these days and. I think as a coach, I think that definitely helps when you can um, uh, adopt different sort of approaches at things, but because you understand different experiences and different ways of looking at things. Um, what is it that you're really passionate about today? Ian? Yeah, yeah, you know, it, my passion today is, is has the same as my passion as when I was a 13 year old, when I decided to be a, a clinical psychologist then. Um, that's young. That is, yeah. So very, very young when I made, made that decision and that passion is to help people improve their stories. Um, even as a 13 year old, I was sitting down and I was always curious about why people did what they did. Um, it first started with me in my own home life, um, with fear of judgment, never, never want to be too high on the totem pole because then you have a level of expectations to be excellent in everything that you do. And that there's no days off in that respect. Um, there's also that judgment of not being so far down the totem pole that you're always under the guise of someone's always watching you because they can't trust you or because you need extra help. So I didn't want that attention either. So I was just yeah. breaking even in the middle, just trying not basically hide in certain ways. Um, and from that experience, and obviously it's led me on a path of wanting to help people just to improve their own stories, because I can see the potential in what people can do. And sometimes it's, it's their own histories, their own choices, their own um, decisions influence what they do and how they do it. And while we start from a different place of reference, we're always going forward and doing something to try and improve ourselves. So my passion <clears throat> is and has always been to help people improve their own stories. What What does that mean? So when, when we say when you when you say improve their stories for the listener, mm -hmm. if they've never heard that kind of you know, sort of narrative before, what what do you mean by that specifically? Sure. So when I say stories, um, we are like similar to a movie or a novel. Um, we are not only the author, we're the characters. We are setting the scene. We are the ones directing. We are the ones writing. And as such, we are the authors in our own stories. And as such, what we see in a particular moment right here, right now is offering a reflection of who we've been and the decisions that we've made up to this point in our story. Oftentimes when we're trying to transform and trying to be something else and trying to improve ourselves, we're um, oftentimes jumping into the middle of a chapter of a book, yet we haven't read the beginning of the book. So I mm. often tell my clients, don't judge the book on the chapter you walked in on, because oftentimes we're, off to, we're coming with it with a bias. We're coming in with it, the characters in our lives, be it me with all my degrees, so Mr. Degree, or someone who's always right, or someone who needs validation, or who, someone who's Mr. Crutch, because he's always propping up people. Those are our characters that have kept us safe in our life, um, who've helped us create decisions and helped us navigate the world, all going back to when we were just kids and we didn't know how to speak and we were just reacting to what people did based off of uh, their smiles, our cries, our hunger. And yet that's the only emotions that we had, but that's how we navigated the world. And those characters come through to us around that safety, right? As we think about our own evolution, just as people across years, hundreds of years, right? And so in yeah. that context, they create characters in our world and our stories. And that story is not only as a character, but it's also our environment. So we think about the people, places, and things that we're surrounded by that offer reinforcement of who we are. That creates the fabric of our setting and our environments and decisions. 
And so as such, when I'm talking about improving our stories, we're not just looking about ourselves, we're looking about the fabric of what's around us as well. And yeah. when we're improving that, it's just not one thing. It's not saying, hey, I just want to lose weight or um, I just want a new job title. I want more money. It's okay, you want to lose more weight. Now, what relationship do you now need to have with yourself to be able to exercise and go consistently? What relationship do you now need to change with food? What's the relationship you now need to change with your friends and family who may or may not be in that same mindset as you wanting to lose weight? Likewise, want to get a new job or want a new job title. What are you now willing to do? What have you now set yourself up to get that new job or title? What experiences have you created? What does that job title really mean? Ultimately, is that your, really your goal? And yeah. so when we when we start to peel back those fabrics of those things, now we're now we're creating a new story for ourselves and creating the possibility for that. And so that's what I mean by saying um, transforming our stories because it's just not one thing. Yeah, no, I like that. I really like that because it using that that word, the story, it gives it opens things up way more than just saying, you know, just improve your life or just transform mm -hmm. your life. You know, yeah. that you can you we all have the stories that we tell ourselves in our head about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's a, a past limiting belief or experience that, you know, that the story is running all the time about how we're not good enough. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's almost a bit more practical way of looking at self-improvement rather than just let's try and achieve a goal or let's try and improve my life. And it, it really is. And <clears throat> to that very statement and taking it from this nebulous life conversation and, and so daunting and, and really putting it into the fabric of a story. It also underscores the fact that our stories are never linear. Um, there is a zigzag that happens in our lives where in certain areas of our life we might be really great or in other parts that we're really not that good. So as an example, I was working with a client recently. Um, she was outstanding at doing work, being a great project manager. Um, you put her in a work setting, she'd be outstanding at that. When it came to a personal life, however, it was all over the place. Didn't have really good relationships with her kid or kids, plural, you know, was in a very toxic relationship. And so everything that she was good at at, at work, she was basically just as bad probably in, in her in her personal life. And so that's not always the anchoring point and we're never in one place all the time, but it did underscore that that our lives don't necessarily always match across the fabric of our own stories. And so in that respect, we know we're going to have our ebbs and flows across our relationships, across the way we think about ourselves, across uh, how we, we, we interact with others, our jobs, et cetera, even our emotional states. It ebbs and flows. And so in that context, it, there's never an ending point. So Nike has a you know, famous commercial and they always said, you know, there is no finish line. Because they're really, if we think about as we're evolving as people, um, both mind, body, and soul, um, it's never done. It's mm. when we think we're done, we're already behind. Mm. And so as we put it in the context of that slogan, that there is no finish line, we're always in that continuous path of growth. It doesn't mean we're doing it every day, but it is something we just need to be conscious about, recognizing that we're, by nature as humans, always evolving. Fantastic. Yeah. So getting into some of like the practical sort of ways of thinking about this and, and implementation for the mm -hmm. listener. Uh, you obviously you wrote a book um, to, to help this. So can you just share a few details about the book? Yeah, sure. Um, so for those who don't know, I'm also the author of this book, Intention, Building Capabilities to Transform Your Story. Um, it speaks to my passion. It speaks to um, the fabric of how we, in my mind, should be transforming. Um, Intention offers a, a breakdown and acts as a guide for reader, readers, both in its analogies, both fiction and nonfiction, um, stories about myself, stories about my clients. Um, more specifically, this guide is intended to really bring depth to who we are and the things we think about as we're going along a journey of transformation. In particular, the book is broken into five different parts. Um, the first part is around discovery discovery of what is our reason for changing? What are we actually uncovering? Oftentimes, as we often know, that what we see and feel is just a result of many other decisions and actions. And so what are we truly solving for in that moment in time? We get so anchored on what we think we should be doing versus based on what other people say, 
based on others' expectations, even the expectations we have in ourselves, the stories we have in our mind. And yet, is that really the issue that, or the challenge, or even the possibility of which we're really trying to solve for? In my experience, oftentimes it's not. There's so many other things that we're actually delving into. So the first part is around discovery and asking readers to actually get into that mode and really begin to peel back that, as you mentioned, the onion. Yeah. The second part of the book is around the principle of you, um, building the capability of the principle of you. Oftentimes we start and embark upon a, a change. We don't understand our own characters. We don't understand our own environments that keep us where we are and have kept us safe. Also, I'm in that part. I'm asking people to acknowledge, what are you willing to do? You know, as, as you know, from a workout standpoint, oftentimes people say, hey, I want to lose that 20 pounds. Well, if you're not willing to give up drinking milk at two o'clock in the morning because that's just your vice, well, all right, well, you might have a little bit of tr struggle, right? We might need to curtail what you're willing to do from a dietary standpoint, mm -hmm. <laughs> or if you don't want to work out all the time, or what days are you willing to do to work out? Okay, that may influence what we're willing to do in our plan. And so the third part around that is once we have that, we start to build a plan. So once we understand truly what we're discovered in that first capability, the second piece of principle of view of who you are, your environment that keeps us where we are and, and what we're willing to do, we could then build a plan that's based on reality. Most of the time we jump to this, this plan part, right? Uh, because yeah. we just say, shit, I just need to go and do, <laughs> go do, 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 do. Unfortunately, that sets us up for failure because now our, our success is defined based off of not necessarily our authenticity. It's based off of somebody else or something else. It's about just getting into the dress versus truly building into the fabric of who we are. And so in that respect, that third part is around building a plan that's truly authentic to who we are as people and what we're truly discovering. The fourth capability we're building is experience. And, I, and while people like to talk about experience um, in the context of we are that doing definition, I really like to define it um, through my time as a, as a former bartender of that is making cheap mistakes. You know, as a bartender, you wanna make, you wanna pour your juices before you pour your liquor in a particular drink. Yeah. Because if you overpour on a, a juice, you could throw that out. That's a cheaper mistake than if you overpour on liquor. Now, while, while that might be good for a patron, right? They want, they want more liquor most of the time, but from a, bar ownership standpoint, that's money out the door. So we want to make the cheap mistake and make sure that we're building ourselves up for success and not trying to do everything at once. That also means we have to consolidate our movements. Again, this is all around experience. I also got consolidating our movements from bartending as well. Whereas that we're, we're not just doing things for the sake of doing them. We're doing them with purpose. We're doing them with intention. We're now keeping that forefront of mind. And from that experience, from uh, we then move into the last capability, and that's attunement, giving us a chance to step back and reflect on what we've Sorry, done. Sorry, well, I missed that last one. Oh, oh attunement. attunement. So attunement. So that's about reflection, being in tune with ourselves. So within this part and throughout the fabric of the entire book, I actually build in and ask readers and listeners to take a step back and really become attuned with what they're thinking, feeling, and providing an objective assessment of who they, what they've decided and what they did. In those moments, we're removing the noise of the outside world of the doing, 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 because we define oftentimes our success by our return on investment. If people don't see you doing anything, then you must not really be doing anything. Like working out. Sometimes the best thing you can do is get some sleep, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Or yeah, what are you putting in your body? How much water are you drinking? Right. That if we don't see it, then you must not be working out. What are you doing for your your mentals? What are you doing for your mind to relax? And so in that attunement piece, giving people the challenge, because it's not always easy, but giving people the right just to stop and reflect on what they said they were going to do. What did it what really happened and allowing them to then move forward. And from that, <clears throat> we're constantly evolving, constantly learning about ourselves constantly checking and adjusting so we can move forward. So based on building those five capabilities, we end with a place of now reinforcement and allowing ourselves to not think about this as a linear process, but one of, oh, we're going backwards and forwards, learning, creating new situations, readjusting who I am, thinking about who I am. Am I, was I really authentic to myself to begin with? And as such, that's when we start to begin to transform our stories. Yeah, and in a way, that last bit is is almost more important than the five previous steps, right? Because yeah. 
that the temptation is for people to, you know, buy a book, follow the five steps and then be transformed. Um, yes. Whereas <laughs> the, the brain doesn't work like that, does it? You know, we, we the brain is built through repetition and just constantly going through the process is, is the key. I'm just curious out of those five steps, what do your clients tend to find the hardest, hardest part? Sure. The, the, the hardest part is typically the first part, the first yep, two parts. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> always, always the hardest part. And, and I spent a lot of time on that. You know, it's, it's interesting uh, to answer your question. Um, I'll answer it more specifically here in a moment, but to even answer your can't question, when I first wrote this book <clears throat> uh, for the second time, because I didn't like the first version, um, I gave it to uh, one of my editors who had never read the book before. And before looking at all of her feedback, all of her feedback, I actually asked her, what did she think about the book? Right before we got into the details. And she said she liked how the book was upfront and set the white lines. Upfront, it's very daunting because this book, cognitively, anyone can read it, right? Uh, you'll, you'll be able to digest it. But this book is intended to be experienced. And as such, I start off the book with asking very hard questions. And it sets the parameters within the white lines we're playing on the football field, on the pitch. And it sets, hey, here are the rules of engagement. And it's those oh shit moments, like let's start that off. And then as the book uh, goes along, it begins to open up. Even the examples become a little bit more playful as such. This is where also my clients struggle the most because I'm establishing a new foundation for them, establishing new patterns and templates on way to think about themselves. Because guess what? your discovery of whatever you think your problem is, that's always going to change regardless of where you are in your life, depending upon if you got married, if you got a new job, if you have kids, uh, whatever that new is, that is always going to change. And so we need to begin to ask ourselves some hard questions to really establish that. So oftentimes my clients in that very first part struggle with, oh, I'm just feeling overwhelmed. All right, well, what's the cause of that? Let's start, let's have a conversation about what may be causing that. Overwhelm is an end result <laughs> of a number of different things. So let's talk about those other things. You want a new job. That's an end result. What are the things that we are going to build the fabric of your capabilities, a la your behaviors? That begins to get people to think about all of that good stuff. Also, where they struggle is that second part, too, is the principle of you. And this is where my clinical psychology stuff comes on, where a lot of self-help books will just kind of mask over that or just say, hey, we'll just touch on it slightly. I really wanted to say, hey, look, let's be authentic to who we are. Let's take it from an acknowledgement standpoint, not offering a judgment of right, wrong, but say, hey, here's who I am. And that who I am is just good enough. And quite frankly, I could stay exactly where I am. But if I wanna do something different, let's acknowledge that here's some of the decisions, here's the fabric of my environment, here are my characters that, and here are my choices that are gonna influence what I'm going to do. And let's just be honest. I can't compare myself, Matt, to you and what your values might be and your direction of your, the things that you're willing to do. I can't do that. I can't necessarily compare myself to that. We may have do some of the similar things, but I have to also make that choice for myself to say, yes, this is what's going to be built in. And so oftentimes my clients do struggle with that as well. because They don't necessarily want to spend the time there. But I've found that if we don't do discovery and understand the principle of, of you correctly, guess what? I can almost guarantee you the ultimate goal of sustainment, even if we get through the behaviors, I can almost guarantee that level of sustainment is going to drop exponentially. There's a direct correlation to the lack of sustainment in one's life around any change, going back to the fact that they probably didn't solve the right problem or the challenge, mm -hmm. or they don't know who they are and what they're willing to do. I think the, um, the, the fitness analogy is quite a good one here, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. for people that, um, uh, like your gym goers, maybe they've not trained. We, we've seen this in, since lockdown, actually, people not trained for a year or two and they want to jump straight to the big weights and, and mm -hmm. do the big things. And yes. um, or, or people that, you know, have gained lots of weight and then they, they come and they, they maybe have done diets before and they, they suddenly restrict their calories massively. And they, it's a little bit the same with, with personal development, that, that first, mm. that discovery part, and that principle of you part is is so important just like you have to lay the foundations of, of fitness first you, you need to work and have good mobility you need to have good technique mm -hmm. if you've not got those two things then you're probably going to injure yourself 
And then mm-hmm. the same goes with if, if you are doing some personal development work and working on your future goals, but you're not actually taking into account who you are, what you value, what's important to you, what's your purpose, then, you know, it's that whole analogy of the ladder could be leaning against the wrong wall and you're, you know, you're climbing the ladder maybe in your career or, or in your life mm-hmm. somehow and in a relationship, but it turns out that it's not the ladder that really takes you to where you want to be. A- absolutely. Um, and, you know, we get anchored on so many different goals and expectations that are thrust upon us or the ones that we have within our own minds, but without really knowing who we are and what really is making us happy and passionate. Um, oftentimes we get the question of, what if I don't know where to go? What if I don't know what my goal is? Um, I know a lot of people struggle with that. And to that answer, I, it, I have more questions. Of what are you passionate about? What's the reason you get up in the morning? What's the thing that makes you most happy? If you could do anything um, money agnostic, what would that be? Now, yeah. you know, some people are like, oh. Do you find people follow. really struggle to answer those questions? I really do. Yeah. Um, and it's really interesting because it's less about change. It's about understanding who you are at that point. Mm. <laughs> so you can't change something if you don't know. It's kind of like having a GPS without an address. If you don't know what address or where you want to go, there's nothing that I can do for you other than ask you where do you want to go from a GPS standpoint. I'm just yeah. going to help you navigate that journey. And it's really amazing. Like as a personal trainer, we already know that people are coming in there to lose weight, get healthy and be exercised. So they're gonna have a different challenge, right? Of like, how do I integrate this into my life, <laughs> right? I'm sure you see it all the time too with, um, you know, New Year's, New Year's resolutions. Oh, I'm gonna lose all this weight. I wanna be in better health, et cetera. What happens? They're great for that first month. That second month starts to tick down. That third month, they're probably out, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, because they haven't integrated into their life. They haven't changed anything. And as important as any change in doing something new, people also have to give up something. They have to let go. Mm. So the biggest challenge that I see is, you know, a number of ways, as I've described as well, aside from discovery and the principle of you, it also comes down to, do you really know who you are and what you want? And then secondly, what are you willing to give up? Because you can't do it all. And so uh, that's something I also focus on with my clients. You, you kind of obviously, w- within the name of your book, you, you kind of summarize all of this and package mm-hmm. it into the one word, which is intention. Mm-hmm. What, what, is, what does intention mean to you? Yeah, um, intention is, is a loaded word. And I think we banter it around quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I'm working with intention. Um, um, but for me, and I describe in the book early on, is that intention is, is a state of mind. Um, it's a state of mind with an, with an, a purposeful, uh, action taken. It's not only having the action, but it's having the mindset. It's called attention as well. And it's also personal will. It's that conscious ability of thinking, feeling, and doing to then take steps to move forward. It's really an opportunity for us to provide context and using our words, our actions, and our feelings to shape who we want to be moving forward. So the opposite has to be conscious. Sorry. Oh yeah, that's it. The opposite of intention then, just just for people listening to be really clear, is maybe going through life and and not really having that self awareness around the journey they're going on. Yeah, it's um uh, the the the. Uh, antonym of intention in my mind would be walking around unconscious, walking around happy-go-lucky, um, those who just let things come to them. When, and there's nothing wrong with those things, right? As, as you know, I talk about in the book as well, there was a, a statistic that said, you know, we make between 2,000 and 10,000 decisions each day. Um, and about 95% of those decisions are unconscious like the things we just go around and just do. Mm. And so if we're looking to do something different, if we want to walk, go around and be purposeful and, and to lose that weight, weight, to get that new job, to have better relationships, to communicate better, <clears throat> we're not necessarily starting from ground zero, but we do need to think about it consciously every single day of what do I now need to do to eat better? 
How do I shop? Now, what routines do I need to build into the fabric of who I am and what I'm doing? Or to get a new job, what routines do I need to build and what skills do I need to build? I need to be very intentional about that. What mentors do I need? If I'm looking to improve my air quote life, because life is a loaded word, where does that start? Because life is so much more than just one thing. But we have to be purposeful about that. And um, in that context, it's just not, we're not going to a milestone of saying we just did it one time. It is doing something very consistently. And to do that, we have to think about it uh, consistently as well. What one of your top, you know, top, top few uh, practical things that, you know, listeners can, can do to start living a more intentional life? You, any sort of top tips that uh, you can give away maybe that are in the book? Yeah, I think there's, 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 there's two, right? I think number one is it's around understanding your, your purpose and your value. Um, that's a very individual choice that may be influenced by others and your upbringing, but recognizing who you are. I think that's the first and foremost part. Um, the reason why that tip is extremely important is the fact that it authors in an opportunity to take stock in our choices and where we go. And without that, it doesn't really matter what's going to happen. The second piece in the tip is recognizing that we're going to have to own our own pace. Um, I also talk about this in a book. Um, pace is an acronym I use for we need to be patient because change is a long journey and we have to take ourselves off the hook because as we talked about earlier, people are looking for fast results. And that's what that change is not about that. Transformation is, isn't about that. This book is not about that. We need to be patient. The A is about holding ourselves accountable. Just recognizing that, did I say and do what I said I was gonna do? Yeah, um, yeah. Right, because <laughs> sometimes we're like, oh, I let myself off the hook. I, I you know, it's like, oh, I, you give yourself excuses. No one's, no one at this point um, can take the accountability away from you. That's you and you. That's between you and you. <laughs> That's not between you and anybody else when it comes to personal change. Um, commitment is the C. Um, the C in being committed to what you're doing. Because if you're not committed, guess what? I can guarantee you're not going to do it. And the E is uh, two things. N number one, emotion. We have to be able to manage our emotion because we are going to put ourselves in a very vulnerable state by doing something different. We're going to be up for judgment we're going to be up for visibility we have to be up for the failure so we have to manage those emotions in that moment because we get anxiety we get fear we get those oh shit <laughs> but guess what that's probably the right place where you need to be which leads to me to the other e of enjoyment you have to enjoy what you're doing like this is about improving yourself and uh, that this process is not linear it is a zigzag and that's why you're building a capability because whatever you're solving for today is going to change tomorrow. And but you have to build the capabilities to manage that and how we think, feel and do. And as such, once you go through this exercise of reading the book and going through an experience in a real time fashion, it can then pick, be picked up again and be offered as a reminder of what you should be doing at each at each stop. Nice. <clears throat> for anyone listening to this podcast, and maybe they're new to like personal development in general. And they're thinking, okay, yeah, this is this is you know, something that I maybe think about. Maybe I'll mm -hmm. buy the book. Maybe I'll work through these five steps. Just from your experience as, as a coach, what are the typical sort of not challenges, but how long does it take for someone to to really start to make implementing these changes part of their life? Yeah, <clears throat> it's it's that is hard because sometimes we have to, again, as I mentioned, uh, we have to let go. Of certain things and being comfortable with letting go that means changing the nature of our relationships uh with family friends changing the relationship of our even our routine of waking up in the morning to go to the mm -hmm. gym early or finding that sweet spot of what makes sense for you changing our eating habits changing the way that um, we interact with an environment all geared towards keeping us where we are because our environment is often going to tell us and offer us feedback unconsciously around are we moving in, in one direction. So as an example, I was working with one client and um, in fact, as he was describing it, he had a, had a friend of whom he just bounced ideas off of outside of our coaching engagement because he needed support along that journey. And this friend was always um, 
saying no or questioning what he was doing, didn't really understand the direction that he was taking and the reasons he was taking it. And this really bothered, you know, my coachee. And one of the things I told him was your friend is offering you wonderful feedback because number one, uh, him not knowing means that you're expanding him. But secondly, what it also means is that you're going down the right path. Because if you if he knew everything that you were doing and that he was supporting yeah. you, then that's his comfort zone, not necessarily yours. This has to be your journey. This has to be your plan. And so in that respect, it's that's one of the bigger challenges because when people go through this journey and try to do things by ourselves, it's like, oh, I got this, I got that. But we take ourselves off the hook. And then secondly, we get feedback from our environment saying, okay, well, maybe I'm not doing this right. Maybe, I'm, maybe, maybe I should stay right where I am. Um, and in those moments, I tell my clients often um, two things. Number one, you're, you, be, you have a plan, you build your plan, but your path is your path. It's no different, and to that, it's no different than Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, that old movie. Right? Yeah. She was told to get back to Kansas. She needed to walk down this yellow brick road. She didn't know what was down that yellow brick road. All she knew was this was the road to take me back to Kansas, of which Oz was nothing more than a milestone. Recognize that she didn't know that she was going to run into the Wicked Witch of the West, the Cowardly Lion, the Tin Man, Scarecrow, any of that. All she knew was to get down this, to get back to Kansas, I need to walk down this road. Her plan was just to walk. Her, her path was to experience everything that she was going to experience, but she trusted herself enough to do it. Is that a so, big challenge for a lot of the people you work with? That their, their path gets, um, that they, they lose confidence because of maybe relationships or other people mm -hmm. to follow that path? Yep. They, the, the relationships with other people, they don't trust themselves enough. They don't believe they have the capabilities to experience it. They don't also have the fight to get through it as well and to figure it out. Mm. They're willing to just say, you know what, I'm done, you know, or I've done it once. I'm good. <laughs> right. Um, we often probably see that in, in personal training a lot. Like, oh, I got to my goal. Great. Yeah. I did yeah. it. And now what happens? As you mentioned, from a COVID standpoint, they balloon in weight, they stop exercising, they stop doing whatever. Now they're starting right back from where they started, you know, three years ago. Now we're having to make back up. And now we're at to work twice as hard. So in that context, no different than Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, we have to have confidence in ourselves knowing that we know what our plan is, work our plan, but also trust ourselves enough to actually get through it because you don't know what's going to happen. No different than COVID, but we have the capabilities and the behaviors and confidence to actually move forward. Yeah, no, fantastic. I'd love to know, actually, you know, moving from being a clinical psychologist to moving into more of like a coaching role, how has that differed in your, you know, the way that you work and, and how does that feel in terms of delivery as well? Yeah, you know, the biggest challenge is uh, the difference in delivery, um, quite honestly. So just for context, when I was uh, working a, as a clinician, I worked in a 24 hour lockdown ward. So in that context, uh, people in this case, adults were coming into a 20, you know, a, 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 a uh, I'll call it a, a area of a hospital where it was locked down, where you needed a key to get in and get out. And everyone's behavior was controlled. For these individuals, they were dealing with chemical imbalances where they were now gonna be dependent upon medication and support mm. for the entirety of their life in a way that we as air quote normal people outside of those walls these walls were actually able to navigate and then it's about choice for them what was key was getting them stabilized and getting them back on track from a group and individual therapy standpoint and even working with their family to help them navigate the world outside of those four walls the challenge was once you take anyone outside of a four wall standpoint and getting them acclimated in 14 days and most oftentimes it was months <laughs> that they were there that when you put them back out into the world, now they're back into the routines of what they're doing and, and their families and so forth. So they think they're back to normalcy and thus they don't need the medication. Conversely, when I'm working with clients, both in organizations or individuals outside of organizations, navigate the path of their own stories and their life, their starting point's a lot different. They're already doing well. They're now trying to expand beyond their immediate box. 
they're not relying upon medication to cr create normalcy. They're now re reliant upon new situations and experiences to create expansion, to now increase and um, be better. So the dialogue is a little bit different from a starting point standpoint. But what is always true is that one, both groups want to be better. Also, both groups need to make choices and understand that their life is changing. One, that one has to give up the idea that they can do this on their own and that they're all going to be dependent upon these drugs and this medication to operate in, uh, within the world. Within the clients of outside of that framework and the more normal area who are trying to now expand and be dominant, they are going to now have to give up some of the choices that they've made and what made them comfortable from a survival standpoint mm. and also gain that support. So everyone's starting place is different and within that respect. But the skills I use are very similar in that it's about expansion and recognizing the choices that one is going to make, as well as how they help integrate that into their life so they can sustain it moving forward. Nice, nice, amazing, amazing work that you're doing. Um, are, are there any common themes that you get with the clients that you work with? You, you mentioned obviously a lot of them, uh, you know, mm -hmm. overwhelmed. But I mean, but you know, in in this day and age, are, are there any? I'm sure there are many sort of common themes that you see. Yeah, I think there, there are uh, several common themes that I've seen across the board. And I think you've touched on as well from a, a behavior standpoint. I think we're starting to see it across the globe as well. Um, number one, people are horrible at change. <laughs> we are, we are. Wow, that's, uh, that's good. I like, I like blunt. That's good. <laughs> yeah, we're horrible at it. Um, as you described from a working out standpoint, people are, you know, just want the end result. They can't sustain it. I think the other aligned to that, we, you know, as we think about COVID and people trying to get back to normalcy, we're so quick to say, yes, we're back to normal. I got my shot. I would just want to go back to doing everything I was doing before. And yet now what happens to the cases skyrocket and go back up again. Hmm. Um, that's a common theme as we think about the fabric of just changing our own lives, whereby we haven't really built an infrastructure to actually manage change. Um, it's something we respond, we react to. Not necessarily something we respond to because of that a lot of my clients um who have really struggled during the the COVID era um, and even before then but it has really come out now is that they haven't put in enough work around who they are they're really just looking at end results rather than building in the fabric of building a foundation to move forward they haven't necessarily taken that ability to say let me be patient in this they've really just said i just want an end result because we don't have the noise surrounding us of our day to days to keep us busy, that focus on our individual selves is so now daunting. The quiet noise is louder than any train moving right by us. And so because of that, the real challenge in that respect is now peeling back and saying, you know what, you are successful in who you are and what you've done. But in order for you to move forward, you are going to have to let go of some of the things that have made you successful today. And that's a tough pill for people to swallow. To say, you know what, I'm already successful. Why should I do anything different in that in the context of that fabric of life? Mm. And they can say, yes, yes, you are successful in that. But recognize that creates a ceiling for you. Now you've capped yourself. If you want to now go beyond this ceiling, you are going to need to do things different, which may require you to take a few steps backwards because you're going to be building capabilities that you may not necessarily have today. And I think because of those two things, I've really seen a common theme for my clients up to this point, um, which one makes my book when I wrote it prior to COVID poignant, but also reinforces some of those behaviors of which I'm trying to build for sustainment purposes as they move forward. Yeah, and that's that's the key word, isn't it? Sustainability is what we 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 all want. I mean, a few things that you mentioned there. I think it's really good that you you just sort of bluntly said people are horrible at change because <laughs> I think sometimes when we are having all these discussions and people listen to podcasts on personal development and, you know, achieving your goals, it all sounds very grand and, and, you know, uh, a, a little overwhelming, I guess. And I think it's good to be humble and just to be really honest and just say, look, it's, you know, change is tough. And if yeah. you're struggling that this is why just one step at a time, working through five simple steps, but even those five simple steps, you might spend like a whole month just on step one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you move on and, and go to step two, but, and, and then that moves on to the key word that you said after that, which is just having patience. And mm -hmm. that's, 
that's a skill in itself, right? <laughs> you know, everyone wants the fast results. I guess we've been conditioned with the way life is these days. You know, everything's so click at a button, you know, to, to have everything here and now. Yes. Um, but life still hasn't changed. You know, humans, you know, haven't really evolved much over the last few hundred years. We still yeah. need to be patient. So, uh, other, and, and the process is just so important, isn't it? Yes, the process. Yeah, the process is extremely important. Um, and to your to your very acknowledgement, you know what we're surrounded by in life. Um, creates a fictitious view into what it really takes to get something done and to really transform. Um, as you mentioned, it's uh, defined by a click of a button. Um, our virtual reality of being whoever we want to be and creating it in that moment where that is off offers and authors in a certain level of assistance in a number of different ways. But if we want to transform who we are, this living being that's that we're talking with right now, that does take a long process because it is about your mind, what we think. It is our body of what of how we are spiritually and what we do in that respect. And our actions. You know, what are we actually doing? And how are we managing our emotions? All of that can't be tied to a, a virtual reality or a click of a button that does take time and it does take a level of vulnerability that quite frankly social media and other avenues just don't afford yeah no 100 we, we, you, you've got to take that that quiet time out you know in your week in your day away just just you and you know whether it's a journal or writing notes or mm -hmm. you know Giving, or, or working with a coach like yourself, you know, that, that can be one of the most powerful things that you can do um, mm -hmm. because you're not just having that same conversation in your head all the time. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and as a coach, I have a coach, right? When, yeah. I, wrote my, when I wrote this book, uh, my editor, she was also my editor and coach um, of how to write. So I was writing scholastically and writing for business. It's a heck of a lot different writing than writing for a book. And so it was a long process. Some of it was good. Some of it was just like painstakingly, like painstakingly awful. Um, but there was things that I needed to get past based on my own 13 year old self around that again, going back to that kid around judgment that I ha did not allow myself to write this first version of this book in a way that was truly authentic or even transformative. So in that respect, my editor had to coach me through some of that um, and get through that process of constantly push. And so I recognize in order for me to be the person or the author this book needed me to be, I need to go through my own journey. And I recognize that doesn't make me less than that just tries. That's the definition of me wanting to be better. And um, but also better for myself, but also being a client of my book as well as the author. But yeah, but that way you're leading by example as well, right? You know, you're Absolutely. that that's the that's the key thing. Uh, yeah. No, Ian, this has been a really, a really fun conversation. I, I'm sure the listener has taken lots of notes. Um, the th next step for them always to grab a copy of your book and work yeah. through those five steps. You know, uh, where, where would be the best place for listeners to you know, read more into your intention strategy and, and mm -hmm. just your coaching in general? Sure. So there's two places um, that they can reach me. So we were talking about social media. So I'll start there. I uh, think about I'll be found on Twitter and Instagram um, with the handle of Dr. B underscore intention. Um, that's on both Instagram and Twitter, as well as I can be found on my business website, which is RhodesSmith.com. That's R-H-O-D-E-S-S-M-I-T-H.com. There they can see this podcast as well as many others where I've been offering uh, some perspective, as well as they'll see a copy of the book Intention, Building Capabilities to Transform Your Story, as well as some of my offerings, more specifically the group coaching that I offer, uh, which is international. Um, so it's a small group, six week group coaching uh, framework that I go through with the clients, as well as my one on one coaching as well. Fantastic. Well, what we'll do, we'll, we'll put all that into the show notes. So sure. people can easily find all the links and uh, and uh, yeah, continue to to learn more. I think um, 
Uh, I think everyone's going to get lots out of this. Uh, any last words uh, of wisdom? Anything last thing you want to share? Yeah, there's, there's there's one thing I'll share, and it's actually from a um, it's a quote I I like, and I picked up from a book called The Prince. Um, it's it was written by a gentleman by Niccolo Machiavelli, ironically in 1532. Um, and the quote is or that he had was. He who does not lay his foundations beforehand may by great abilities do so afterwards, but with great danger to the architect and trouble to the building. And so as we think about any transformation, and we've talked about this, it is about foundation and laying the, you know, the grass root and understanding the process that we have to go through. Um, we're so built to be able to handle it afterwards, right? We're just trying to get to an end result that we think, oh, I, I can do it afterwards. I can do it afterwards. We can sweep it under the rug. But recognize that it will be great trouble to the architect, a la you trying to make any changes at the end, because now you have to put in twice as much work for something you could have corrected before. And it's danger to the building, because just like a good game of Jenga, where you're building all these blocks, so you start removing things, and otherwise, you now change the infrastructure of who you are. So just take the time. And recognize that you are building a foundation and that does take a little bit more time that does take a little bit more effort but it's gonna be worth it in the end yeah and that's a foundation that again does have to be serviced at regular yeah. intervals throughout your life right yes yes not a one-time thing it is continuous <laughs> <laughs> like, otherwise, let me, let me otherwise the foundation. cracks start to show <laughs> right and what was a foundational thing yesterday may not be the foundational thing tomorrow so and it's about adjusting that so that's where yeah. building air capabilities really comes into play yeah it all ties back into together doesn't it fantastic yes. thanks thanks again um ian it's been uh, been really fun conversation and yeah likewise uh, matt thanks for having me here uh great conversation